Got it. It says got it. Hi, my name is David Sergal, and uh, I've been involved in macrobiotics now for well over 40 years. I started in 1974 in Sydney, Australia, and uh, I found that um, uh, the effect on my health was immediate uh, for the better, and uh, the state of mind definitely, um, uh, definitely was opening. And um, uh, to the extent that I, I never looked back, I never have looked back in terms of uh, missing meat or uh, other foods that I might have grown up with. I just got into macrobiotics and um, I studied on my own for um, a few years. And in the beginning, I didn't even know about Michio. Um, I just read George Osawa's book. And I was very interested in the, in the principle of a dualistic monism. That really got me in. And uh, then towards the end, like uh, in 1977, I started in July of 1974. And then sometime through 1977, a couple from Boston, Dan and Marcia Weber, came to Sydney and started the first macrobiotic center. They were fantastic. Um, so I lived in their study house for a few months, seven months, something like that. Then uh, I always wanted to go to Japan. I was very, very interested in Japan. So firstly, I flew into Southeast Asia, spent a few weeks there, then arrived in Osaka. And uh, uh, then at their suggestion studied, um, went to a, an Oki yoga, uh, uh, what they call dojo uh, place place of training for about two weeks. It was uh, really rigorous. And I discovered after that training, I'm definitely not gonna become an Oki yoga teacher. So I then uh, sort of uh, felt pretty down about it because I'd trained very hard in Australia to do, to be right on top of things. So I went to Kyoto for a couple of months and couldn't figure out what I was going to do. But the idea was leaving Australia was to make a career out of macrobiotics. And um, so when I was in Kyoto, I decided I'll go to Tokyo. So I went up to Tokyo and I went to the Macrobiotic Center and there was an ad for classes in Zen Shiatsu. And uh, the teacher Masanaga, Shizuto Masanaga, or Masanaga Shizuto as the Japanese would say, um, uh, was offering classes in English that were organized by uh, two European fellows, um, Eric Stocks and, and um, Thomas Nelson. Thomas was the brother of Adelbert, who was uh, quite well known in the macrobiotic community. So I went to those classes and I found out that uh, Masanaga, his, he had studied macrobiotics with Osawa and he, his approach to shiatsu was very similar to uh, my macrobiotic understanding. So I figured maybe this is what I should be doing. Uh, the thought of being a counselor, that kind of thing, just didn't, never entered my mind because basic principle of macrobiotics, you had to figure it out yourself, right? So I decided to stay in Japan. I was meant to stay there for a couple of months and it ended up being four years. Um, I uh, fell in love with a lovely Japanese woman, uh, Toko, who's my wife. We've been married now for 40 years. And uh, in 1982, in the summer of 1982, which was like a peak time in macrobiotics, uh, we came to Boston. And uh, it was peak time because um, a book had just been released by Anthony Satellaro on um, how he healed himself from cancer. And uh, then I had all this shiatsu information I wanted to share with people. So I wanted to do a book on shiatsu. But in Japan, I'd only studied um, uh, technique, not theory. So in in uh, Boston, I spent six years studying uh, theory uh, from a macrobiotic perspective. And I combined that with, uh, with the um, uh, technique and I made this book. This was the second printing. The first book was called The Macrobiotic Way of Zen Shiatsu. The working title was the mac a macrobiotic approach to Zen Shiatsu. But if you get a hold of this book, 
you'll see I'm very interested in philosophy and theory. So this book was the first stage in what became what I'm studying now. And I decided to do this project, which is going to be hopefully six books. And um, the first book will be a carry on from the theory in this book. And the other five books will be one book for each energy transformation. So um, I wish you a long life. That sounds great. Uh, I need it. Yes, thank you very much. That was the first uh, printing. That, that was the first printing. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Um, so uh, just let's go into uh, today's class. So uh, when I was reading um, uh, Michio's material, I think the first thing that really struck me that I re was really impressed with was a very simple thing that he said. And he, in the, he was teaching the five transformations, which I'd known at, at, until then only as the five elements, but he made one major change, which seems such a little thing, but it was, for me, it was major. And that was, he started talking about tree energy. He didn't talk about wood, he talked about tree. And once he used that word, then you could see a cycle, you could see a rotation. And um, then I started reading his books and uh, his approach to nine star key, astrology based on the five transformations, actually based on uh, the book called the I Ching. Some of you, I'm sure, most of you perhaps are familiar with that. And um, when I was reading his work, some things made sense and other things didn't make sense. It wasn't that they weren't correct or whatever, but my, my question would be, well, how did he come to that conclusion? How did he figure that out, right? So I also became very interested in uh, Taoism and I started reading this book. This is my favorite translation. This is called The Guiding Light of Lao Tzu. It's out of print. It's by a gentleman called Henry Wei, W-E-I. And for me, this is the best translation for me, right? But I also have about 20 copies here of different writers and they're all very interesting, but I find his particularly good. And uh, he says, I've changed one word because of the times, but his translation was man patterns after earth, earth patterns after heaven, heaven, patterns after Tao, and Tao patterns after innate freedom. So I changed man to person. And my approach uh, to, um, to all of this um, is that the, the development, what we're working on is in focusing on ourselves. We can be thinking about ourselves in terms of a community, but the idea is that we change ourselves for the purpose of the community, right? Um, so when you look at that, man patterns after earth, person patterns after earth, earth after heaven, heaven after the tower, tower after freedom, we can see a relationship between our relationship with the earth and innate freedom. So by understanding the earth from this perspective, we can learn universal principles. So my approach to that was, okay, we have this system with five transformations, five images, tree, fire, soil, metal, and water. So what we do is we break down each of those images into its components. For example, we could say, if we begin with uh, water, water can be hard or soft. Um, we could, water flows to the lowest place. Water, as in a river, appears dark from a distance. We could talk about a tree. Very simply, a tree grows. A tree has roots. A tree grows towards the sun. A tree has rings which tell of its age. A tree grows at its periphery. So let's go over those two, two points with tree before I go on. A tree grows towards the sun and a tree grows at its periphery. Now, if we go to the list of correspondences, this is uh, coming from Michio. This is from my book, but this actually came from Michio. 
So if we go down here, the way Mitchell have put it, it says physical roots, tree, eyes, right? Sense, sight. Now, if we look at tree energy, the way I just explained, a tree grows towards the sun, there we can see the connection with the eyes. You know, it's, we can't see it connected, uh, let's say with, um, with the tongue or the lips, but the eyes, ah, yes, right? So a tree responds to light, okay? And then we find when we study the books on uh, classical Chinese medicine, that um, the planning function uh, is connected with tree energy as well through the liver organ. So when we think about it from the point of view of, of a tree growing towards light, we can see the connection with imagination, with image. You can't have a plan without having an image, right? So we can see how they brought that connection up. And then if we look at the one that says a tree grows at its periphery, that helps us to explain the next one down here, the physical branches of tree energy are the nails. So this is the trunk, this is the limb, and the part that's growing out here, the nails, is connected with this tree energy, right? So in that way, by doing this observation, we can start to see how these traditional observations or connections or correspondences take place. To give you a few more, if we go down to fire, a fire, this is a very important one we're going to cover today. A fire draws immediately from its fuel source, right? A fire draws immediately from its fuel source. If you don't have fuel, you don't have fire. So there's an immediate connection between the fuel and the expression of that fuel. A fire rises to a point. A fire burns and in burning causes pain. A fire searches constantly for fuel. A fire can become huge. Soil energy. Soil, as soil is the ground at our feet. Soil, as earth, doesn't move much. Soil produces food. Soil provides the environment for things to grow. Soil protects itself by covering itself. Right? And metal. Metal is found within the earth. Metal is separated from the earth and in the process finds itself above the earth. Metal can be melted down and used again in a different way. Metal can be polished and become shiny and reflective. Metal rusts. Okay, so we start off with that basic idea and we can see already how it might help us understand traditional correspondences. But what does this mean in, in ourselves, in our being? So when we, fortunately through Michio's teachings, for me anyway, he gave us a way of understanding that. And that was through Nine Star Key. And Nine Star Key shows us how each individual carries this particular energy. You can be born in a tree year or a fire year and so forth. And by saying that, you are carrying that particular quality of energy. So I put these things together and I thought, well, fortunately with Wikipedia, when I looked up some uh, profiles, uh, so many famous people, we can find out what their birthdays are. And if we go to some very good quality magazines, it could be, um, for example, the New Yorker or uh, New York Times Magazine or um, Time Magazine. Uh, I also look at New York, but I, I'm very, I've had uh, one of the problems is sort of trying to limit the magazines because to get the good, a, a good profile takes quite a lot of search. But anyway, through that, I look for uh, profiles where I could find the date of birth. And then I would go through the profile, thinking about it from the point of view of these observations that I've just explained with you. And we're going to start now with Ariel Sharon. And Ariel Sharon was the 11th prime minister. By the way, 
um, a lot of these names that I'm going to be mentioning, I've never heard them uh, pronounced before. So if my pronunciation is incorrect, please correct me, okay? So Sharon was the 11th Prime Minister of Israel. And the observation from the natural environment is a fire appears suddenly out of nowhere, right? Now, when you think of fire, right? You're warming, right? Something's happened then, boom, suddenly there's fire. It's a very sudden appearance, okay? So when we keep that in mind or when we know that, it kind of is interesting in terms of things that we've seen in public. So two classic examples in America of nine fire people, that means people born in a nine fire year. Uh, first is Sarah Palin, right? So fire is also, fire also attracts, right? So she, she gained attention, I think, also because she was an attractive woman, but what happened in her case was the appearance was sudden. People knew her in Alaska, but she became a national identity overnight. A fire appears suddenly out of nowhere. And the other one that was really interesting in this regard is the former, the recent president, Donald Trump. No surprise here, Donald was born in a fire year, right? And if you go back to when he was elected president, not only was everybody surprised, well, not everyone, but most people were more than surprised, but he was surprised. Apparently, he wasn't expecting to be elected. He just thought this would be a good uh, promotional gimmick. So within that context, let's look at um, Ariel Sharon. And I've got the quotes. And then there are a few other words in the quotes, and I'll explain those to you. So you also um, have to consider surprise happens with uh, other words are used instead of surprise. So it could be things happen accidentally. A person is unpredictable. A person, we underestimate him. The classic underestimation was of George W. Bush. People really underestimated him. Uh, in terms of his success, or his, uh, that's getting political, but people underestimated George W. Bush. And things happen unexpectedly. These are all fire related issues. Now, here's Sharon, quote, defiant and brusque, Mr. Sharon had many enemies who denounced him as self-promoting, self-righteous and unyielding but he was also courtly to his political rivals and had a, here it comes in, right? A surprising sense of humor. His popular appeal was consistently underestimated, right? So the other words that we want to mention here, firstly, is sense of humor. You'll see in fire, fire people generally, the, the classic uh, correspondence with fire is laughter. So there tends to be overall a sense of humor uh, in fire people, famous comedians. Uh, George Carlin was born in a fire year. Stephen Colbert was born in a fire year. Um, let's see, uh, Gallagher, I call Gallagher. And there's one other popular person that'll come to me later because I always- Christina Perello is a nine fire. Hmm? Christina Perillo, yeah. All right, okay. So uh, I don't know Christina, but she's out there. Fire is out there. She's got a lovely smile, right? Often I think, um, I actually wrote about this, uh, I've got to put it back on my blog, that um, uh, a smile, uh, or our teeth actually, our teeth, but the appearance of our teeth reflects our fire nature. Fire is light. The teeth are light, so it can reveal um, humor, but it can also reveal, um, uh, what's the word, uh, uh, war, if you like, right? You know, when people show their teeth, a classic mm -hmm. example of that is um, some movie with um, Jack Nicholson. I forget which one it is now, but there's, you'll see a picture of him with gritting his teeth or showing his teeth that's very... Right, he was born in a fire year. Uh, but anyway, sense of humor is 
uh, prevalent in fire people. So a sense of humor, manifesting a sense of humor is manifesting in a positive way, your fire nature. And it, and it doesn't matter whether you were born in a fire year or not, where by, by, man, by showing your sense of humor, you're expressing your fire nature. And then it says uh, his popular, popular appeal, populists, fire people like Trump are often populists, okay? Next, next quotation. He was dismissed as washed up in 1983 when he was forced to resign as defense minister after an official committee charged him with indirect responsibility for a Lebanese massacre of hundreds of Palestinians the previous year. Mr. Sharon survived, the, survived, survived that humiliation. Humiliation, like becoming humble, right? Fire energy is high, rising up. Humiliation is down. It's the worst thing that can happen to a fire person. Um, and remain politically active enough to take command of his rudderless Likud, Likud party? Likud. Likud. Likud, okay. Mm -hmm. Of his rudderless Likud party. So the commentator there is actually talking about the water nature of the Likud party. It's rudderless. It doesn't know where it's going. That's a water... That's a water image because water has a destination. Water knows where it's going. If a person is rudderless, there's something wrong with their water nature. Their water nature is low. So continuing. Um, his rudder, rudderless liquid party after a 1999 route by labor. Even then he was viewed as a seat warmer for younger leaders, yet he surprised everyone again when in 2001, he was elected prime minister. And here comes the next one, which is really important in the biggest landslide in Israel's history. The biggest landslide in Israel's history. Keep that in mind for later. Next quote, Mr. Barak of the Labour Party defeated Mr. Netanyahu in 1999, but after the collapse of his peace talks with the Palestinians, Mr. Barak, Barak, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Called for new elections for early 2001. It was widely expected that Mr. Netanyahu would run for the Likud party. When he decided not to, Mr. Sharon, the stand-in party chief, became the unexpected candidate and surprise winner, okay? Next quote, Sharon had not lost the capacity to astound, right? Astounding is another form of surprise. When I went to interview the new Sharon in 2001, I found an old Sharon, stubborn, opportunistic, blunt. When I went to interview the old Sharon in 2003, I found a new Sharon ready to make radical, painful concessions. And now in 2005, when the new Sharon was actually leading the withdrawal from Gaza, I was faced with a Sharon more old than new. Even when he was altering the course of history, he did not cease to be in the enigmatic, unpredictable, unpredictable, right? Same, so these words, accidental, unpredictable, astound, unexpected. These are all manifestations of surprise. And those are all manifestations of fire nature. So when you're reading, when you come across these qualities in conversation, in experiences in life, you're talking or you're, you're getting the sense of fire nature in that person, whether it be positive or negative, okay? So the next one with Sharon is a fire can become huge, right? A fire can become huge. So taking the quote that I've already given you, 2001, he was elected prime minister in the biggest landslide in Israel's history. The other quality in his case of bigness is this one. Sharon, who is five feet seven, <laughs> and was approaching 300 pounds, right? Clearly had no patience for 
modern slimming rituals. And somehow or other, I put the other quote related to this somewhere. Um, the other quote in terms of bigness in his case was that he owned the biggest farm in the, is it called Negev? Is it the Negev? The, it, yeah, okay. So Sharon was the owner of the biggest farm, right? So this image of bigness comes into play in that way. The last one that was interesting in his case has to do with walls. If I understand correctly, he was the one who established the wall between Israel and Palestine. Is mm. that right? I, I don't know. Anybody? Don't you have a wall separating? We do. Yeah. We do. That's... I'm pretty sure he was responsible for that. And what's significant about that is Donald Trump, Nine Fire, is responsible for trying to establish this wall on the southern border. And in uh, classical Chinese medicine, uh, there is a function called the heart governor related to the pericardium, which is a protective function. And fire, fire energy in terms of uh, uh, Mars, the god of war, partly that is to protect what you have. So the image of protection or protecting uh, also has a fire quality to it. Okay, any quick questions so far? Great. Next one is Ben Zion Netanyahu. Ben Zion, the father. Okay. Ben Zion was born in a nine fire year as well. Okay. And I'll read it out here. In his New Yorker article, Mr. Remnick, who is the editor of the New Yorker, wrote that Israelis seemed in the dark about the extent of Ben Zion Netanyahu's influence on his son. Ben Zion Netanyahu, he wrote, was nearly- David, David yep. ben, ben Sion. Uh, good, thank you. Ben Sion, Ben Sion, okay. Ben Sion was nearly a legend, a kind of secret, but he added using the younger Netanyahu's nickname, Bibi, to understand Bibi, you have to understand the father. Okay. So here's the quote, my observation, a fire is immediately dependent on its fuel supply, right? A fire is immediately dependent on its fuel supply. Here's the quote, Netanyahu's father was an erudite scholar of Jewish history who exerted an outsized influence. Here we have the nine fire again, right? Bigness. He exerted an outsized influence on his tight-knit family. The elder Netanyahu held what the greatest held held to what the greatest 20th century Jewish historians, Salo Brown, called the lachrymose or tearful conception of Jewish history. This view can be readily summarized in a line uttered by Benzion Netanyahu to David Remnick for a 1998 profile on Bibi. Quote, Jewish history is in large measure a history of Holocausts, right? Jewish history is in large measure a history of Holocausts. So um, the significant part of that is that he's seeing Jewish history in terms of death, right? As I said, the, the, the observation uh, is that a fire is immediately dependent on its fuel supply. No fuel, no fire. I maintain that if that is the case, then fire people are very connected or concerned about security and the issue of death will come up in their life experience as a major concern. So in his case, it was, uh, he's manifesting it in terms of um, Jewish history, but then another, and now I need more help with uh, uh, translation, with uh, uh, correct pronunciation, Eli Weissel, 
correct or not? Eli Weissel, Ellie Weissel. Okay. It's not Weasel. It's, hmm? I don't know. I don't know. I thought it was Weasel, but I might be wrong. I don't okay. know. Okay. He, he was also born in a 9 5 year. Okay. And here's the quote Preserver of the memory of the Holocaust. His personal project has been to keep the wounds of Auschwitz open by repeatedly pouring the salt of new literary reconstructions upon them and thus to prevent the collective Jewish memory and his own from quietly letting the wounds heal. So again, he's focused on, on death, if you like, on this separation. So this particular quality, oh my goodness, where is it? Oh, oh it's right in front of me. It's all right, it's right here, I think. No, it's not. Um, Gee whiz, I thought I had everything well prepared here. Um, okay. uh, here we go. Right. I have here, here, as you can see, one, uh, oh my goodness. Oh, it's the other way. Oh my goodness. I'm going to have to step back to the other room, I think. Hold on. I have a four pages, here we go, I've got them. I have four pages of people's connection, that's separate, of, of five people who have some connection with death, okay? And we'll start with Bill Gates, okay? Bill Gates was born in a nine fire year, and he was the first to bring attention to the danger of pandemics. And interestingly, in this case, the chief, the chief research scientist dealing with death from bat viruses in Wuhan is a lady called Shi Zheng Li, S-H-I, you can see, that's her name there, Shi Zheng Li. She was also born in a 9-5 year. So again, she's talking about death, okay? But they, it happens in different ways. There's a lady called Charlotte Holdman, who is a lawyer for those on death row. Jack Kevorkian, who was a, a proponent of euthanasia, was known as Dr. Death. And Gary Mack, a Dallas broadcaster, whose fascination with the Kennedy assassination led him to become a widely consulted expert on that event. And John Paulson's very interesting. You know, when the economy went belly up in 2008, he made something like $4 billion, right? So how did he do it? Mr. Paulson, who was born in Queens and graduated from the Harvard Business School, gained prominence and earned billions by betting on the collapse of the real estate market long before many other investors did, okay? He set up two funds as early as 2006, specifically designed to take advantage of a decline in subprime loans. So, and, and this, this one is incredible. T. Boone Pickens. Remember, all of these people were born in a fire year, right? Uh, he was very much involved with his university. His, what do you call it? His, he was an, an alumni. He, and he was a, a billionaire, very wealthy man. And uh, uh, he, uh, the, the heading of the quote is betting on death in insurance. So he wanted to take out life insurance policies on, on alumni from the university. And, and uh, when they die off, collect the insurance policy for the university. <laughs> Lastly, Craig Venter. Right? Craig Venter mapped the genome. Now he's trying to decode death. That's the heading of the article on him. So that's an, those are other examples of that particular quality. Uh, the other interesting thing about Vincion was that his father, Nathan, was a rabbi. And 
what's interesting about that is that I am starting to collect the list now. A lot of people born in a fire year were raised in a religious household. Very interesting, I think. There's a, there's a connection between nine fire and religion. Okay, so this moves us down to the sun. So in this uh, sy system, uh, you know, are you all familiar with the five transformations? All right. There is a nourishing cycle where water nourishes tree, nourishes fire, nourishes soil, nourishes metal, nourishes water, right? Uh, productions, productive cycle. And then there's a control cycle. And in that control cycle, fire melts metal. Fire controls metal, okay? So Ben Sion was born in a nine fire year. And I'm not sure how you pronounce the, his name, but I'll say Benjamin, okay? The son, Benjamin, was born in a six metal year, okay? And the first thing that's really interesting in terms of him being born in a six metal year is of the um, eight energies in the I Ching, which is the astrology, which is the book on which Nine Star Key Astrology is based, the strongest energy is six metal. And what we find is that of the 13 prime ministers of Israel, five of those prime ministers were born in a six metal year. They include Netanyahu, David Ben-Gurion, Yitzhak, Yitzhak, Yitzhak Rabin, Lev, Levi Eshkol, and Menachem Begin. So you really need, I'm imagining, I've never been to Israel, but from what I can see of what happens over there, you need really strong leadership. You need people who are really able to create a strong environment for people to live. So, um, and I think that Netanyahu was the longest serving prime minister, right? So that's the first thing that we need to know about Netanyahu. Firstly, that his father is born in a fire year. He was born in a six metal year and six metal is a particularly appropriate energy, it would appear to lead Israel. Now let's go into the quote, okay? <clears throat> People who know Netanyahu, the son, say his stern and unswervingly hawkish father, Ben Sion, remains the most influential person in his orbit. Netanyahu himself has described consulting his father before major decisions. Quote, you have to listen carefully to the father when you judge Bibi, says E.L. Megid, does any, do you know that name? Who has spent time with them together, referring to Netanyahu by his nickname. Bibi is not a rebel. He can't get himself free from this tie with his father. And here's the important part of the quote. Ben Sion sits on his shoulder and he can't move. End of quote. A former advisor to Netanyahu confers, quote, his father has a huge influence on him. Huge. So I've already explained that a fire can become huge. So in this particular relationship, Ben Sion's fire largest, his hugeness, is in his influence on his son. Okay. And the other part that was important in that, um, I have here some notes. Later in the text, the word towering is used to describe the influence of Ben Sion on Israeli culture, right? So his bigness also reflected uh, on his influence in, on Israel in general. 
and there's one more thing that I wanted to say here. Um, right. The connection between metal and shouldering responsibility can be seen again with Benjamin in the title of a profile on him. Israeli peace efforts rest on Netanyahu's shoulders. Israeli peace efforts rests on Netanyahu's shoulders. This is very significant because when we look at this chart here, this is a, a, a chart of the uh, flow of the, uh, of the energy channels in the body. The very top one here is the large intestine channel. The large intestine corresponds with metal. So in other words, the image of the shoulders and shouldering responsibility is a literal one. And you can take it back to the early days, to the really early days, when, um, uh, when uh, miners were searching for gold and they would carry over their shoulders this heavy bag of dirt with hopefully metal gold in it, right? So the image here is of shouldering responsibility equals metal or shouldering a burden equals metal. A lot of people born in a metal year go through stages of depression or feeling down, right? Uh, so we can see some connection that way and some support of that idea of shouldering responsibility. We can see in another Israeli, uh, prominent Israeli politician, and that is a lady called Zipi Livni. How do you, Zipi Livni, how's that one, Clara? Zippy. Zippy. Sit, sit, sit. Sit. Zippy. <laughs> okay, all right. I'll have to practice that later. Uh, she was also born like Netanyahu in a six metal year, okay? So we expect she's gonna be a strong woman. Here's the quote. It was quote about uh, in the year 2016. Achieving a two-state solution, Livni said, is quote, the reason for me to be in politics, end of quote. It's also a task, quote, not quote, I'm, I'm uh, highlighting it, it's also a task that rests very much on her shoulders. Given her relationships with Palestinian officials, her credibility with the international community, and these days at least her rapport with Netanyahu, Livni may be the only person who can drag Israelis and Palestinians together and after 65 years of conflict, broker an agreement both sides can live with. Quote continues, but I think you get the picture. This leads to a non-Israeli person, her name's Kerry Washington. She's the star of the hit TV show, Scandal, playing Olivia Pope. Anybody familiar with that? I don't watch those sort of shows much. I don't watch TV much. So what the quote says is here. For many devotees, the show's depiction of a complex black woman at the top of her game, her racial identity, never a big deal, is the cherry on top. Paradoxically, attention to the breakout role has meant Miss Washington must carry the racial aspirations and fantasies of more than a few fans, as well as the expectation that her success could open doors in the notoriously race averse world of network television. And then comes the quote of somebody who is uh, interested in her thing, we're putting a lot of our hopes on Kerry's shoulders, right? So we see again, that six metal people have the, they find themselves in a position number one and they have the strength to take on responsibility, okay? Or shouldering a burden, uh, uh, shouldering a burden. Next, Gal Gadot, how do you pronounce? Gal Gadot, okay. Right? All right, all right. So, not surprisingly, considering she's playing Wonder Woman and, and uh, six metal corresponds with strength, she was born in a six metal year. And the interesting thing about this particular case is that the original inspiration of the original, sorry, 
theory. One of the pot inspirations of the original uh, um, Wonder Woman comic book was a woman called Olive Byrne. And she was also born in a six metal year. We can also uh, see that Stan Lee, who created many of the comic characters in the Marvel comic series, uh, he died recently. He was a very, very well liked man. He was also born in a six metal year. And Chadwick Boseman, who died recently, play, who played the superhero Black Panther in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, um, interestingly, in his case, died of colon cancer. And this can bring up, we can talk about, that's another issue, but uh, the large intestine, as I've already explained, corresponds with metal. And he died of a metal-related illness, colon cancer. Okay. All right, so we're up to 12.45. I've got a, a little bit more. Um, tell me how we're going and if you want to stop or if you want to continue. Uh, personally, I, I think it's amazing. I would like to continue. Um, let me uh, tell, hold on just a moment. Okay, the next... Uh, concerns um, a gentleman, and again, I need help with pronunciation, Yair Lapid. Excellent. Okay, all right. Um, now, there's an interesting thing here in uh, Nine Star Key in these, um, uh, in these numbers. There are three numbers, actually. The first number corresponds with their core energy. The second number, I say, corresponds uh, with the way that energy is channeled, and the third number corresponds with the way that energy is expressed. And in his case, he was born in a one water year, and his numbers are one, nine, and a six. So remember, nine corresponds with surprise, right? But the reason that I originally chose to write about him, and it's a very short piece, is that what we find in a lot of these profiles is that the person who's writing the profile starts using uh, language that corresponds with the energy of the person being profiled, right? For example, when uh, President Obama was talking about Michelle Obama, uh, who was born in a water year, he, he, he described her comments on his party as being rudderless. It's classic, clearly a water image that he was using. So in the case of Yair, it says, firstly, the surprise of the recent Israeli election, right? He was the surprise of the recent Israeli election, but this is not the recent one, it's 2013. And here's the quote. This was a campaign that was despondent in a way, says Ofer Shalar, a fellow journalist who ran on Lapid's list, quote, as a candidate, my main problem was not that people didn't think our ideas were good. It was just a general feeling of a political despair. And then the surge. Now in this approach, water energy is seen, is imaged by a river. So water energy is considered in movement, in forward movement. So a surge is a classic water image but first but further it goes and says this and then the surge it will go down in israeli election history on the friday before the tuesday balloting the last surveys allowed by law showed lapid winning just 12 seats he ended up with seven more says shalar quote it was like standing on a dry riverbed when somebody blows up a dam. The flood was unbelievable, right? So I thought that was an amazing quote considering he was born in a water year, right? Okay, so a similar quote uh, refers not to an Israeli, but to a gentleman called Carl Icahn. Some of you may be familiar with Icahn. He's an American business magnate and majority shareholder in, of Icahn Enterprises. Okay, very wealthy man, net worth of 20 plus billion dollars. And again, this time, 
this is very interesting. Another important observation of water. Water is always pressing against the wall of its container. We have the dam, right? So we had the image in the first one about a dam, right? But here we have another one with the dam. Icon is born in a one mortar year. Quote, nonetheless, an entire industry of bankers and lawyers, mercenaries like Goldman Sachs, as Icon puts it, has sprung up to protect CEOs and corporate boards from Icon's stinging jabs. Given the balance sheets out there, they're going to be busy. Quote, all this cash is dammed up at these companies, says Icon. We are the catalyst to enable them to do something with it. And that's the end of the quote and the comment. Rest assured, Icon will be taking notes about who's helping him break the dams and who isn't. So I just like both of those quotes to show us the connection between water in imagery and the person's nature. The last one is about water. And we're talking this time about the 12th Prime Minister of Israel, who is, or who was, okay, uh, Ehud Olmert. Olmert? All right, okay. So what, uh, again, we bring up the same comment. Water is always pressing against the walls of its container, right? Water is always pressing against the walls of its container. And the important part of this particular quote is that if this is the case, if water is always pressing against the wall, it always has this feeling, wants to get out, then water has within it the sense of confinement. Okay? So what we find is that many water uh, birth people go through stages of confinement in some ways. And in the case of leaders, many prominent leaders have spent time in prison. So Olmet uh, went to jail and we have Lula da Silva, the 35th president of Brazil. Uh, we have Aung San Suu Kyi in Burma, who was under house arrest for many, many years. Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in prison. John McCain spent five years in prison in Vietnam as a, a prisoner of war. And I don't know how to pronounce his name, Vaclav Havel. He also was spending time in, uh, he spent time in prison. And in uh, right now, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy of France was born in a war to year. And he's just recently been, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, not fined. He was recently found guilty of corruption and stands to spend time in prison. So the moral of the story is, uh, especially if you're a leader, don't break the law because you've got a much higher chance of going to jail than other people. But also in modern life, we can see uh, people who are born in a one water year who go through stages of confinement. And the two that stand out currently, the first is Meghan Markle, right? Prince Harry's wife. And uh, obviously she wanted to bust out of that situation in, in, uh, with the royal family. There was a uh, restriction there. And the other, which has been a lot in the news a lot in the United States is Britney Spears, who's been under the confinement of her father having the control of, of uh, her life. And she's been trying to uh, break up, uh, through the, I forget what the legal term is, but uh, trying to break away from his control of her life, her legal, her money and other aspects of her life. So those are two classic examples in prod, uh, modern life, but you have other people born in one water year and you might see something of this nature come up during their life. You have Princess Masako, Masako in Japan. This, hers was really uh, tough and was, uh, goes back 20 years now. She was described as being in a gilded cage. Um, but uh, in our Western life, uh, Princess Kate and also Ivanka, 
be interesting to see how her life pans out. You know, we might, you might think of uh, the success or the expansive nature of their wealth and so forth, but there could also be uh, within her nature or her situation, this sense of confinement. And anybody, if you're born in a water year, you'll probably go through stages of restriction. Um, and that's just part of the learning process for people born in a water year. So that's what I prepared for today's uh, uh, presentation. If you have any questions, I'm open to seeing if I can answer, but that's the end of the actual uh, talk. I feel like it's just the beginning. There's so much information and I feel like mm -hmm. there's so much more. Uh, well, there is a lot more. There's about another, um, I don't know, over a thousand profiles to discuss with you. Um, but um, there are, there are some, who did I miss? Oh, I'll tell you who was interesting that I didn't talk about, and I'm not going to today because I haven't prepared the profile properly. Uh, Yuval Harari, is that his name? Very interesting. Um, his, uh, his comments from the point of view of being born in a six metal year. Six metal corresponds with heaven. So six metal people have this big perspective on life, which he classically does. I forget the others. There were a couple of others. Um, I have profiles of Golda Meir, of um, uh, another leader. Uh, oh, Perez. I found his, his um, profile quite interesting too. All right. So fascinating, David. I, I just love the, the depth of your, your insights and um, how you make it all very real. Um, I, I love it. And I'm wondering, um, I know this is off the point of, of the people involved, which is very, very fascinating. Do you by any chance uh, ever do the Ninestarchy of the, the nations, like Israel itself? Do you know the, the Nine Star Key of Israel? Well, Nine Star Key of Israel is uh, seven metal. And seven, really? that, that is according to the, um, pro, uh, according to the, uh, the day that the, uh, right. what do you call it, In, inauguration of Israel was on May something, 1948. That's a seven. That's a seven metal year. Yeah. So seven metal. The things that classic things that are related to seven metal are high tech. And boy, does Israel know all about that stuff, right? Yeah. And uh, the other is social media is classic seven metal. Oh, and yeah. if you want uh, another country, I this is my personal point of view. Uh, it's not a. I don't know who else has this point of view, but having lived in Japan and being quite a fan of the country. I really feel that Japan is like classic seven metal. Uh, seven metal people tend to be very social and um, uh, they, their social nature is also connected to hard work. And mm -hmm. their front, they have a front and they have a back. And it's not that the, the front and the back uh, where one is false and one is true. It's definitely not the case in Japan. I don't think so. But it's a way the front of seven metal people is reflecting what's in front of them. So what they reflect is not necessarily what they feel behind. The, the way to understand a seven metal person is seeing what are they reflecting? In other words, are they pointed this way or are they pointed that way or this way, right? Oh, yes. That's how you get some sense of what the seven metal person is about. The other is interesting point about seven metal is the mask. I think that um, that's very interesting, especially like in uh, traditional uh, or classical Japanese um, acting, in no acting. It's all done with masks, you know? Yes. Um, yes. So um, the idea of, and the other interesting point about that, there was an interesting uh, article on an actress called Audrey Plaza. I think that's it. Plaza, P L A Z A. The, the article was um, the article was about uh, does um, is she is she appropriate for heading the uh, for being the MC of the Oscars? She's an actress, right? Yeah. And she was born in a seven metal year, right? But it was a question: is she the right one, right? 
But when you look at the Oscars, awards ceremonies correspond with seven medals. In other words, seven metal in, uh, in the system, when you apply it to the uh, yearly rotation, corresponds with, the time, corresponds with the time immediately after the harvest. The harvest corresponds with two soil, and the time after the harvest is seven metal. So what happens after the harvest? Firstly, you've got something you can trade, you can exchange, right? Okay. And secondly, you've worked very hard, and it's time to relax, right? Time to enjoy. Time to go from the farm down to the town, put on some good clothes, and maybe meet uh, meet someone, you know, make uh, make a friend, you know, make a romantic friend. Yeah. So these things all relate with seven metal. And what, how does it apply to the um, to the awards? It applies because Bob Hope, who uh, was born in a seven metal year, and he emceed the. Uh, he emceed the, um, the Oscars 19 years, right? 19 yeah. times. Yes. And Billy Crystal was also the MC of the Oscars for something like seven, eight or nine years. Yes. He was also born in the seven metal year. So you can see how the idea of getting some sort of recognition for your hard work yeah. also is part of the front of seven metal. Uh, so I think those are also issues related to that. That's wonderful. Thank you. I'd yeah. like to invite Michael Clennon, if you want to unmute yourself, you had a question. Yeah, I can't hear him. Michael Clennon. David, I have a question. Sure. What is your nine star key? That's what the question think? for today. Thank you. What's, what do you think? What do you think? You definitely have some nine fire. Actually, you okay. like to speak and put yourself out. Mm -hmm. But okay. you're pretty smooth. So that's probably some content. Okay, I'm not, I'm not hearing you. <laughs> so you, I don't know to tell you the truth. Okay. I was born in a five soil year, five soil. The three numbers are five, seven, and three. And actually I'm a pretty quiet sort of character. I don't talk much. The only thing I like to talk about is nine star key. So get me going and I won't stop. <laughs> Excellent, brilliant. Okay, thank you. All right, any, any more questions? Yes, David, um, are you in, in Connecticut still? Yes, yes, in Fairfield, Connecticut. Fairfield, are you, are you seeing clients um, for Shiatsu? Uh, in Fairfield, yes. I don't, I'm not traveling into the city at the moment, just here in Fairfield. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and can you give us your email? Is that possible? Yeah, it's um it's my name is one word, lowercase. So it's David Sergal at Optimum. So it's O P T I M U M dot net. Right, dot N E T. Thank you. All right. Maybe we'll hear from you. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Great. You Thank have you. and you look beautiful. You look excellent. <laughs> Great, thank you. A little tired these days. <sighs> David, I'd like yeah. to thank you for okay. an, a wonderful presentation. As I said, I, I, there's, it's just, there's so much more. It, it's, mm -hmm. I, I could, you can, and I could go much further with it. So thank you very much. It's, it's wonderful work you've done. Great, thank you very much. Um, one thing you might be interested in, I haven't, um, I've got a website, but I haven't put anything on it for a couple of years. Um, uh, the website is called uh, ki, keyreview.com. Um, so ki and then review, one word, keyreview.com. And uh, you can get some idea of, um, of the profiles that I've written. And um, 
The reason that I'm not very social at the moment, I'm very, very stressed out over this project because there's so much to do and there's so little time and I want to get the profiles out there. And uh, when I'm uh, starting to publish them again, uh, I, I will put them on that website. But if you uh, friend me on Facebook, uh, when I'm ready to publish, I'll, I'll let people know on Facebook. Um, but I don't have any immediate plans, um, uh, but uh, that's, um, that's where you will, feel, you will see it in the immediate until the books are ready. And that's gonna take some time. Well, I look forward to it. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you. you thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.